Today I'll be talking about the coordinated evolution of gene expression across 309 marine microbial species. And over the last decade, there's been a lot of work looking at the evolution of gene expression and looking at associations between expression and environment. But by and large, these studies have focused on mammals and other species closely related to humans. For example, if a study were to look at the species I'm showing here on this slide, it would be considered an especially diverse contribution to the literature. But all the species that I'm showing here are from a single clade, Bilateria, where even if we only kind of think about eukaryotic species, Bilateria is but a single clade in this overall eukaryotic tree of life that I'm showing here. So to help remedy this gap in the literature, there was a project called the Marine Microbial Eukaryote Transcriptome Sequencing Project, or MMETSP. And they went out all over the world and they collected these marine microbial eukaryotes from across the globe and then did transcriptome profiling on them. And here on this uh, plot, all the red dots indicate a clade that for the first time ever had transcriptome profiling done as a part of this study. And the dashed lines indicate clades that don't even have a single complete genome sequence available. So you can see this project greatly expanded our snapshot of the diversity of eukaryotic life. Now, we can summarize all this MMETSP data in a single matrix, where we, on the columns we have 657 samples, and on the rows we have a little over 4,200 genes, where each entry here is showing the gene expression level of that gene in that sample. And one thing I'd just like to point out is that if you just do a simple unsupervised clustering of the gene expression levels, then you can actually recapitulate the known major phylogenetic groups of these species. Where, for example, the color bar above this heat map shows the major phylogenetic groups, and you can see that, for example, all the heterocons are clustering together just based on expression. Now, there's a lot of really cool questions that we can ask using this data. But I think one of the coolest is to look for evidence of coevolution between genes across these very diverse species. And the traditional way that this has been done is with this method called phylogenetic profiling. And in phylogenetic profiling, you have all your species and a gene is either present or absent across them, where correlated loss of a gene across the species is maybe evidence for coevolution of those genes. Now, using the MMETSP data, we can make two advances. The first one being that we can apply this type of method to the most diverse set of species to date. And the second one being that we can actually use a quantitative trait, gene expression, to look at this type of analysis. Where now, instead of the binary presence or absence of a gene across these species, we can look at the quantitative level of the gene expression. Where we might identify cases of coordinated evolution that were missed before, because even though the gene was present in this species, maybe it's always expressed at a very low level. So here, we might identify genes 2, 3, and 5 as having coordinated evolution. Now, to put this in more concrete terms, we can actually look at some of the real data. So these are two coil-coil domain-containing proteins, 63 and 37. And here, each dot is a different sample with those two genes expression that were measured. And you can see there's a very strong Spearman correlation between the expression of these two genes. Now, one approach is that you could look for just pairs of genes and try and call coordinated evolution between all these pairs. But that's a very tricky endeavor because there's very complex phylogenetic structure in this matrix that you'd have to decompose. So instead, what we can do is we can look across gene sets, where these gene sets have been previously identified for many different types of processes and functions. And perhaps one of the most famous is the cellular genes. So this type of looking for coordinated evolution across gene sets has been done using the traditional method before, most recently in this paper that called their method CLIMB. And this most recent paper, again, recapitulated the cilial gene set as having really strong coordinated evolution. Where here in this picture, I'm just showing some cilial in human cells to help emphasize that these are across many different species that have cilia. And again, these CCDC genes are actually some of these cilial genes. And we can look at a larger collection of them here. And you can see that across all these gene pairs, you're seeing this really strong correlation in the expression. So to help test if our new kind of phylogenetic expression profiling method is recapitulating the results that you get from the known traditional phylogenetic profiling method, we can look at all the different cilial genes that were in this MMETSP data. And we can just ask, if the gene was expressed at all, we're going to call it present. And if it was never expressed, we're going to call it absent. And we can look at the presence-absent correlation between all these different genes shown here in the heat map. And then we can use the phylogenetic expression profiling method where now we just look at the correlations of expression of cases where the gene was present in the species, and we get this. So now what we can do is we can kind of replot this showing just the different expression correlations binned on the x-axis and the presence-absent correlation in form of a box plot for each of those expression correlation bins. And this is just to emphasize that these two measures are extremely correlated, even though one measure is using the presence and absence, and the other measure is only looking at cases where there was a gene expression, so the gene was present, and the correlation of that expression.
So you can see there's a correlation and it's highly significant. Now, this was just for one gene set, so that was for cilial genes. In fact, many gene sets have been identified as having coordinated evolution. And just taking the top scores from this recent Klein paper that I mentioned, we can ask what was the coevolution score that we assigned to all of those gene sets using our technique in this new data set. And that's given by the red line over there, the red arrow. And then we can also take a set of phylogenetically matched sets of random genes that are matched for several different properties for these gene sets. And we can ask, what do we expect by chance? And that's the gray histogram to the left. So you can see we're extremely enriched for calling coordinated evolution in these known gene sets. So with this in hand, we can then ask an even more exciting question, which is what are just all the gene sets that we call having coordinated evolution? And are there any novel ones that have not been discovered before? And what I've done here is I've just plotted all 662 gene sets that we call having coordinated evolution. And they're clustered here by the correlations between the gene sets. And then just drawing a line across the dendrogram here, you can bend the gene sets into different bins and then ask are there gene ontology enrichments in these different bins to get a more broad picture of what are the types of genes that have coordinated evolution. And you can see that we recapitulate known sets, such as the cilial genes and dynein complex genes, and also the ribosome genes. But we also identify novel gene sets as having coordinated evolution, such as DNA repair and the proteasome. And we can plot some of these gene sets as well. So for example, the proteasome genes and the DNA repair genes. And one interesting observation we can make is that it doesn't seem like it's a subset of these genes that are driving these coordinated evolution calls. It's really just kind of spread across all of the different genes in these gene sets. And there's also some smaller gene sets that are more personally relevant to me, like freckling. Um, and this is actually has some of the strongest coordinated evolution within this smaller gene set itself. Now, one thing I want to emphasize here is that many of the gene sets we're calling as significant using this new method are completely invisible to the traditional phylogenetic profiling method. Where here, from the Klein paper I mentioned earlier, I'm plotting their results for the mismatch repair gene set that we called as having significant coordinated evolution in this analysis. And you can see where here blue means the gene was present. Basically, these genes are present across almost all of these species. They're very rarely lost. So the, the traditional method is extremely underpowered to trying to detect coevolution in this instance. Now, the first way we can extend this method is by looking at gene set, gene set coevolution. Where here, we identify two sets of gene, gene sets that have coordinated evolution individually. And then we ask, is there more coordinated evolution between them than we expect by chance? So here, this is genes downregulated in Alzheimer's disease and genes involved in the Golgi apparatus, where you've, one of these interactions is plotted over here on the right. And this is a really interesting, significant association because there's been lots of conditional evidence implicating uh, Golgi, the Golgi apparatus in the pathogenesis of Alzheimer's, and this is yet another line of evidence that adds credence to this hypothesis. Finally, another extension we can make is that if we call a gene set as having significant coordinated evolution, for example, the diabetes pathway genes, then we can just ask, out of all the genes that were measured in our study, what are the ones that have the highest coordinated evolution with all the known genes in that set? And these are potentially novel genes involved in that pathway that haven't been identified yet. So if we do that with the diabetes pathway genes, uh, the top two hits are these genes TULP2 and GCH1. And these are really interesting because TULP2, which is the tubby-like protein 2, is in this linkage region for severe obesity in Europeans. Um, is one of only five or six genes. And GCH1 is a GTP cyclohydrase 1. And this is the genome-wide most significant hit for circulating galactin-3 levels. And galactin-3 levels have been linked to the pathogenesis of diabetes as well. And also, it's a 10 to the minus 6 level GWAS hit for type 2 diabetes. So this is a gene that never would have really been looked at necessarily involved, to be involved in the pathway of diabetes. But now with this additional line of evidence, it's a gene that could be looked into further. Now, taking a step back from this coevolution and coordinated evolution talk, we can take a look now at expression environment associations. So here, the red dots indicate all the different sample locations where MMETSB samples were collected from. So you can see it's a really broad both longitude and latitude d diversity here. And there's also many other variables that were measured from the collection site, such as depth, salinity, temperature, and light. And if we just look at one of these variables, for example, the absolute value of latitude, the top association with latitude is a really interesting gene, POLH, which codes for this DNA polymerase-directed eta. And this gene plays a critical role in DNA repair, and in particular, DNA repair as a response to UV damage. 
And as you see here, when we go to lower latitudes, when there's potentially more UV exposure, you have an upregulation of this gene. So it's potentially some sort of adaptive evolution of the expression. Secondly, instead of looking at environmental variables, we can look at variables in the sequence themselves. So we can use the RNA sequencing reads to create a transcriptome and then call in the coding sequence of the transcriptome the level of the different amino acids in those coding sequences. So for example, we can call the percent of aspartate in the coding sequence of all these different species. And then what we can do is we can ask, is there a positive correlation between the, the amount of aspartate and the level of the aspartate tRNA ligase? And tRNA ligase is what charges the amino acid, the tRNA with its equivalent amino acid. So when you have more aspartate in your coding sequences, in theory, you might need more of this tRNA ligase. And what we see across the 10 tRNA ligases that were measured in the study is that every, all of those 10 times, they have a more positive correlation than you expect by chance. So this is another case where maybe there's some sort of adaptive evolution based on what the coding sequence is. So in summary, I want to emphasize three parts of this. The first is that phylogenetic expression profiling is a powerful tool for identifying coevolution. And the second part is that we can then leverage this method to identify new genes that have associations with known gene sets. And then finally, this is a great data, data set for exploring associations between an expression and environment with potential adaptive implications. And I'd just like to thank everyone in my lab and my funding for helping out with this. Yeah, hi. Hi, Trevor. Um, uh, so, sorry, I might have missed it. How did you incorporate the phylogenetic relatedness of all of your different species? Yeah, so that's a really important point, so I can try to emphasize it a bit more. The reason why we didn't look at single gene-gene interactions is because that's very difficult, because there is a really strong phylogenetic structure. But when you click across many genes in a gene set, the idea is that those genes in that gene set have some phylogenetic structure, in addition to maybe some real coordinated evolution signal. So what we can do is that we can look and say, what's a good estimation of that phylogenetic structure? And we can create that estimate for that gene set. And then we can create a random set of genes that have the same phylogenetic structure, but some random error in the coordinated evolution. And then we can try and see if we saw more coordinated evolution than we expect by chance. So I can go into more detail during the coffee break about the exact method of matching the phylogenetic structure, but that's the idea behind it. Okay, thanks. <laughs>